I think the church has, adults in the church, have begun to equate their religious life with their moral life. What am I doing that's right or wrong? Which laws am I obeying? And so on. And none of that is part of our relationship with God until we're six years old. And we pretty much thought children's religious life therefore began at age six. <laughs> and with the work of the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, we're learning that religious life begins with life, that God is with the child and in relationship with the child from the beginning of life, and that God and the child have no concern for rules or morals <laughs> and, you know, for those six years. And it's not because they're... Um, it, it's not a lack. It's like it's a gift. I want you to be very, very, very good at enjoying being with me. And then when the morals come along, you'll already know how to enjoy being with me, and that will always be the foundation of your religious life. And adults just desperately need to learn how to enjoy God and learn that religious life is about more than the rules. <laughs> When God is working, uh, you know, there is one God. <laughs> and I think we will see uh, in other movements in the world um, the hand of God in the same way that we see it in the Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. So in the work of Chardin, in the work of Montessori, in the work of Cavaletti, in the work of medicine, in the discovery of neuroscience. You know, we're seeing things coming together and we're seeing the same hand of God at work in this. And I think if there were a terrible disparity, then you would wonder, well, where is God working in this? But when you see things coming together and one thing confirming or affirming the, un the oneness of God working in all these ways, and to, and to think, well, we're part of this, you know, so it, it affirms our work and it lets us affirm the work of others. And, um, and so I think that's sort of part of what I look for in how God is working <laughs> in the catechesis. I was part of a charismatic Christian community. It was only about 35 adults. And at a certain point in our development, we had about 35 children <laughs> who were under the ages of six. And all these kids were needing preschool. And I had a background in Montessori. Another member of the community had a background in Montessori. And so it was kind of getting tossed around the community. Oh, we should have a Montessori school. We should have a Montessori school. And then as we began to look at Montessori schools and realized they were all more expensive than we could afford, we said, well, we should have an affordable Montessori school so we could go there. <laughs> and, and then because our common bond was our faith, we wanted it to be a Christian Montessori school. But the work of the catechesis, which had been going on, wasn't even named yet. And so a woman who was a Montessori teacher and a Catholic said to me, once she thrust a piece of paper in my hands and said, if you want to have a Christian Montessori school, go to this. And it was an overview of the catechesis of the Good Shepherd being given by Patricia Coulter in Cleveland, Ohio for a week, she had just finished interpreting or translating the religious potential of the child. So I, you know, I'm not usually obedient, but I said, okay, <laughs> and I took my five-month-old baby and went to Cleveland for a week. I had a tape recorder to leave on the table when he cried, and he never cried. It was just amazing. So I, by the end of the week, I said, she's absolutely right. This is what we must have. And so so I asked Patricia if she would like to come and be the first teacher in our school. And I laugh now that I asked her that because she's a Canadian who will never leave <laughs> except to study with Sophia in Rome, maybe. Uh, but she said, write to Sophia. She knew there was a person, but she didn't give me the name. So I wrote to Sophia, and Sophia wrote to Rebecca Roycewicz and connected us. And Rebecca had just finished her training. She had five years of experience as a Montessori teacher already, and she... Uh, was sitting in Tennessee thinking, how am I going to do this? Where am I going to do this? And when she got our mission statement, she was satisfied. So she came, 
and introduced us all to the catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I feel like I didn't come to the catechesis. It sort of came to me, <laughs> but it was a wonderful gift. And so I, when I, I had to organize a course in order to take it, so I organized a course, and I, I was in the course for maybe two hours, and I had decided to organize this course so that if Rebecca ever had to leave, the program wouldn't end. Somebody ha else had to know it, and I thought, well, I'll learn it. So the course begins, and I'm two hours in, and I'm thinking, who cares about the children? Who cares about the school? <laughs> this is for me. <laughs> like, it was really a wonderful gift to me personally, and it has nourished me ever since. I, it, this is a little long story, but it's so precious to me. <laughs> I had been working in the catechesis for a while, and I had two older boys there. I think they were uh, like fifth grade, and they were the only two boys of their age. So I was meeting with them weekly, and we were studying he the Hebrew scriptures. So we decided to read the story of Joseph and his brothers. And we went through the whole story, and they enjoyed it very much. And then we got to the end where Joseph says to his brothers, you know, I'm Joseph, your brother. Don't don't be sad that you threw me in a cistern and sold me as a slave because God worked through this and is able, therefore, to feed and save the family. And so this was God's work, so don't be sad. And, and the boys understood that, and one of them said, I wonder what plan B was. Because if those brothers hadn't sold Joseph, you know, what would God have done? And the other boy said, I wonder what plan A was. <laughs> and, and what made that so important to me was we look at history, and there have been terrible things, like the Holocaust comes to mind immediately, terrible things. And yet out of these terrible things, there's incredible grace, you know, in the individual stories of certain people who have helped others. And so there's a temptation to say, well, God wanted that terrible thing to happen because obviously these good things came from it. And I think what this boy was saying was, no, God never wanted that to happen. That was not plan A. But when we screwed up plan A <laughs> um, and sold our brother Joseph, you know, as a slave, I can work with that, you know, and bring good things out of it. And that's what God does. And I think that just, to me, kind of catches what's going on in sacred history. And that was a gift to me.